Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. In a moment, we will go to our study. You will see that we will not have a bulletin, but we'll go directly to our teaching, and then we'll conclude the teaching with a few words of encouragement to you who are viewing our services online. Please take the opportunity of letting us know that you're watching, and if you desire to give an offering, you can do so online. If you're watching us via computer, click on the Give button in the upper right corner of your screen. If you're watching on your mobile device or iPad, click Give under the menu button. If this is your first time giving digitally, follow the instruction under Four Ways to Give to process your gift. You can also mail your checks to 12205 North Pipeline Avenue, Chino, California, 91710. And remember, you can still come in and use the kiosks we have in the foyer that are set up to process gifts, or you can place your gift in an envelope and hand it to one of our receptionists in the foyer. Thank you. And with that, let's get into the teaching. Solomon, or Song of Songs, it's called by both names. And uh, we're looking at chapter 4. Song of Solomon, Song of Songs, chapter 4. So let's begin reading together here in chapter 4 at verse 1. I'll read verses uh, 1 through, one through uh, 7, and we'll get into our study. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats. I'll let that set for a moment. <laughs> Going down from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep. And this guy knows how to talk, doesn't he? <laughs> which have come up from the washing, every one of which bears twins, and none is barren among them. Your lips are like a strand of scarlet. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David built for an army. armory on which hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men, and your, your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. You are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. From chapter 1 here in Song of Solomon to chapter 3, verse 5, Solomon has been writing as one who is yet to be married. So we saw that uh, as things that were pertaining to conditions prior to their marriage. But when we got into chapter 3, verses 6 through 10, we, we saw Solomon who was arriving to take his bride, and then in Chapter 3, verse 11, that specifically speaks concerning Solomon's wedding day. And so what we've seen up to chapter 4 has been preparations for, and then the coming for, and then the actual wedding of Solomon and this young woman who is simply referred to as the Shulamite. When we get to chapter 4, chapter 4 actually contains things that relate to a married couple. Uh, the word spouse is used six times from chapter 4, verse 8, to chapter 5, verse 1. And so what we have is we have him as he was, uh, some things pertaining to things prior to marriage, the wedding, and now what we end up with is we're going to be looking at, at the honeymoon. And so this chapter deals with the honeymoon. As we begin, this portion of Scripture actually speaks very openly about sexual intimacy. And some people, obviously, in our day, in churches such as this, have a real problem with that topic. They may even think it's inappropriate to address. But the question has to be asked, where do many people get their ideas concerning physical intimacy? Where do many people get their ideas concerning intimacy? And secondly, we can personalize that by asking, where did you get your ideas? concerning physical intimacy. You see, in our society, most get messages on sex in casual ways. You might walk into a bathroom and see something written on the bathroom wall, or you're driving down the freeway and you see something advertised on a billboard. Kids will speak about sex amongst themselves, sometimes fantasizing, sometimes giving vent to weird thoughts about it. 
Some people were introduced to images of sex uh, by pictures in magazines that they found or magazines that they were introduced to. Others will read these novels, these paperbacks that are sexual in nature. They may read them secretly or may even share them with their friends. And there are others who are discovering things concerning sex by looking at pictures on the internet or they see R-rated movies or they're watching a program on television. Most kids, when they have sex education movies in school, most of the kids I knew when we had those movies, simply, well, we simply laughed at them because they were so corny. Sometimes parents will do their best to give an introduction to the topic, but they're embarrassed when they do so, and they end up saying, well, you need to just wait and talk to your mom later on if you'd like. One thing for sure, the messages that people get today are pretty much the same. The general message you get in our culture is sex is for recreation, there are no repercussions to it, and there are never any penalties attached to casual sex. So just enjoy it because it's like a sport. During the time of the Apostle Paul, Paul had to write a letter to a church in Corinth, Greece, a church that was very well known for its immorality because there were sexual things that were occurring that had to be addressed, and Paul wrote a letter to them. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13, where he says, and actually is using a common saying of the day amongst the Corinthians, where they would say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. So Paul actually has quoted something that was well known in their culture, and that was this, if you have an appetite, quench it. If you're thirsty, you drink. If you're hungry, you eat. And so they use this term, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. And so they would say, with that as a biological drive, if you're thirsty, you drink. If you're hungry, you eat. If you have a desire for intimacy, just engage in it. Well, Paul had to deal with that because that was something that was even within the thoughts of the church. And that's why he said, food for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. And he went on to clarify, he says, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And so what he was saying is you may have a natural appetite, but there is a proper way to express the, um, the extinguishing of that appetite. There is a proper way to do that, in other words. And he's saying your body belongs to God. You see, the message of, of sex is everywhere. We see it in our comedies. There was a, a show all of us are familiar with. It was well known, and it's now syndicated, and so you can see reruns. And, and it was the show Friends, and it was one of those shows that promoted casual sex with the most effectiveness. Anybody who's ever watched the show knows the names of the characters. You have Joey and Monica, you have Chandler and Ross, and you have Rachel, and they were all one thing. They were all promiscuous, but they were likable. Who didn't like friends? But then again, who actually listened to the message? And the message very often was in there was casual sex. So this message is everywhere, but the repercussions of sexual license is ignored. There are communities that have an 80% out of wedlock birth rate. That always increases poverty rates among children. Syphilis and gonorrhea, genital, genital herpes and various STDs are rampant today. And let's not forget that AIDS is a growing problem. But the message of abstinence is laughed at and the question has to be why? Why wait? There are people who would say there's no reason to. As I was sharing with you, we have it backwards in our society. You meet somebody. You have sex with that person. You get to know them. Then you might, you know, get engaged, and then you get married. It's all backwards in the way that our society promotes that, the message of sex. What we have here is an answer to that. What we have here in chapter 4 is a picture of a honeymoon and, and the joy of a honeymoon and what a honeymoon is supposed to be. And those of us who are married, we had our honeymoon experiences, and the honeymoon is supposed to be an exhilarating time where a married couple enjoy one another and get to know one each other and one another in a, in a very intimate way. It's supposed to be excitingly anticipated by the couple. It's supposed to be something that you look forward to. It's not just something that's routine. It's something that's new and fresh. It's something that's vital. And that's what you see here in this chapter. When the couple has not engaged in premarital sex, it's something that the guy very often is real excited about, our honeymoon. I have a friend of mine who's a pastor, and his wife, I'm sorry, not his wife, his daughter. His daughter was getting married, and um, she wanted daddy to just be part of the wedding and didn't want him to perform her wedding ceremony, 
So she asked if I would perform the ceremony so her dad could just be a guest at her wedding. And so I asked him, um, do you have any problem with that? And he was all in favor of it. And so they did all the premarital counseling and got the bride and groom to be prepared. And, and then on their wedding day, I performed their wedding. And I can still remember as I was standing with this young girl and she was virgin and he was virgin. They'd never been together in any way or if anybody else. It was a brand new experience for both of them. They're getting married and, and all. And as I was there on their wedding day, just before I performed the ceremony, I was in the back speaking to them. And I said, uh, I said to her as he was standing there, I said, now, you know, my, my counsel to you would be that, uh, you know, after you get married today, I said, go to your, you know, on your honeymoon. Um, sleep in separate rooms, you know, and just get to know each other better. And she's very innocently smiling at me going, oh, yeah, okay, you know. And he, he's freaking, you know. And, and I looked at him and I said, you don't like that idea? Got you, man, I got you, you know. And he goes, oh, he's all, he thought I was serious. That guy, that guy wanted to get married in the worst way, but she's thinking, you know, what's another week? Uh-uh, men don't think that way. Not at all. The honeymoon is something that's supposed to be exciting. It's anticipated. It's something that you really want to get involved in. I mean, you want, you want to enjoy yourself with your bride and your groom. Now, in Solomon's day, the marriage ceremony was held in the open before witnesses. And at the conclusion of the ceremony, the bride and the groom would go into a private room. And then when the marriage had been consummated, they would return to the wedding celebration. And so that was the normal way that it was done. So this chapter here is with Solomon and his bride finally getting together and enjoying one another in an intimate fashion. Solomon is now able to enjoy his bride. And I want you to see how he approaches her. He begins by speaking to her. This is their honeymoon, and he's speaking to her, and he begins to speak what are called words of love. He says in verse 1, Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. He begins to speak to her. Now Solomon knew something that is very important to be aware of. And that is for women, intimacy normally begins with words and not with physical pressure. Now for a man, the desire for sexual intimacy doesn't need words, just sight. If he looks at her, he's ready. He doesn't even know, need to know anything about the woman. He doesn't even need to know her name. Just looking at her and he could be ready. But Solomon knew something. Solomon knew that lovemaking begins with him letting her know how much he loves her. And that's what he's saying. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, he says, you are fair. That's not a line. They're married. Solomon isn't trying to seduce her. You see, before marriage, men might flatter a woman to try to engage in sexual intimacy. Some women sometimes seem to need to be flattered. It gives them permission to give in. But Solomon didn't use these words to break down her resistance because these words were sincere. These words were real. Words well chosen and sincerely spoken are the voice of the heart. And these were the words from his heart. This is a man who loved this woman enough to wait for her, and now he's letting her know that she was worth waiting for. You are fair, my love. You are fair. Well, earlier in the book, in chapter 1, verse 5, she spoke of herself, and she said, I am dark. In verse 6 of chapter 1, she said, Do not look upon me because I'm dark, because the sun has tanned me. Now, well, Solomon would differ with that. Solomon is saying, No, you are very, very beautiful to me. And he begins to describe her as he's speaking. Notice he says, you have dove's eyes behind your veil. Dove's eyes. Once again, he's using these incredible images that no man would use today. He wouldn't say to Marie, you've got dove's eyes. It's just not, it wouldn't go anywhere. <laughs> but what is that really saying? When he says you have dove's eyes, this is something that you can really gain from, especially we men can gain from this. He's looking into her eyes as he's speaking. A lot of guys don't look into their wives' eyes. Some of you wives know exactly what I'm saying. We, we just don't. We don't look into her eyes. Uh, on couples retreats, there have been times over the years, not every year, but there have been times over the years that I've said to the husbands and wives, 
Okay, everybody, let's stand up. Now I want, husbands, I want you to hold your wife by her hands and look at her. Just look at her for a moment. And I want you to look into her eyes and I want you to say to her, I love you. You ought to see the men squirm. It's true. Men aren't used to doing that. Are you kidding me? Hold and look at her? I, I'm not used to doing that. A lot of us are not. You know, come on, let's face it. We just don't do that. But that is one of the keys to a great relationship. It's an open relationship. He's able to hold her by the hands, look in her eyes and say, I, I, and as he's looking at her, say, I love you. And that's something that men need to learn to do. And so that's how he's able to show her the depth of his concern for her and his love. He's looking right into her eyes and he's telling her openly how beautiful she is, how innocent she is. And this is a sincere form of intimacy, which actually is going to lead to physical intimacy. And he begins to comment on her beauty because her veil is now being removed. He had more than likely never seen her face completely uncovered. That's because a woman's beauty was reserved for her husband's eyes alone. So now he's beginning to see her and he's actually speaking what he's seen. And so he says, notice in verse 1, your hair. So he spoke of her eyes, your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Mount Gilead. Now, I've told Marie that, but I usually go like this, your hair is like a flock of goats. <laughs> she didn't like it, that's why I do it. She'll go, stop it. I did it in between services. I walked into the back and she was sitting there and I go, oh, your hair is like a flock of goats. <laughs> stop it, stop it, that's terrible. I know, that's why I do it. Your eyes are like doves, you know. But what is he saying? He's saying, you have an innocent purity about you, and your hair, as her veil is removed, cascades. And so it's kind of wild and kind of beautiful. You know, in early days, there was, in, when I was a young man, a long time ago, there was a woman that was named Farrah Fawcett, and her hair was all wild, and all the guys liked that, and there were all these posters of Farrah Fawcett with her wild hair, and that's kind of, what he's using as an image, he's saying, I love your hair. It has that wild and free look to it. And he's complimenting her as he's speaking. Now, it's interesting how he goes on in verse 2 to say, your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep, which have come up from the washing. Every one of them bears twins, and none is barren among them. Now, briefly, and then I'll develop this a little further, a woman would wear a veil until she was married. She removes it, and now her husband is seeing her beauty. And he's saying, I am enchanted by your smile. You have a beautiful smile, is what he's saying. Now, when Marie and I met, the day that I met the girl who would become my wife, she was seated on a couch, and I was there talking to her, and, and she was smiling at me. And I have to tell you, her smile captivated me. She had beautiful teeth, and that's basically what he's saying. And what's an interesting kind of humorous thing as he's saying this, at least by our standards, when he says, uh, everyone, uh, everyone of which bears twins and none is barren among them, he's simply saying, you have all your teeth. What a great surprise. She removes her veil, she got two teeth. I mean, oh, my, 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 my. No, but she's got them all. And he said, all right. And he loves her smile. And that smile that she has has captivated his heart. He sees her as a beautiful woman. And as she's smiling at him, he's beginning to desire to kiss her. And that's why he says in verse 3, your lips are like a strand of scarlet. Your mouth is lovely. And your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. Why would you say that? <laughs> like you got apricot head. I mean, why are you saying that? A pomegranate is red in color. She's actually beginning to blush. She's actually, when he's sharing with her, and she's actually disrobing, and as this is happening, and he's looking at her, and he's complimenting her beauty, she's blushing at him, and her blushing is causing him to even have a greater desire because of her purity. And as he's speaking to her and sharing these things, he's actually complimenting her because he wants to kiss her. There's something about her, and she's beginning to blush with embarrassment. So he says in verse 4, Your neck is like the Tower of David built for an armory on which 
hang a thousand bucklers. He's saying, you're open to me. You're not hiding. A tower is in the open. You're not hiding from me. You're not embarrassed by me. But you are obviously openly desirous of me. This is the proper time for them to be together. And she's not hesitating to be his. But he's not rushing forward. He's taking his time as he romances her. And, and he continues. And he says in verse 5, Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the lilies. This is another way of saying you must work out. You've got a nice shape. She's youthful and she's beautiful. But he's not rushing into anything. You see, when he, when he uses a description of fawns, well, fawns are startled easily. So he's showing her consideration. He's aware of her limits and he's aware of her sensitivities. So as they're about to engage in intimacy, He's showing the utmost concern and not rushing brutishly into a relationship that's going to scar her and not going to be something that she finds pleasurable. You see, one of the things about intimacy, it's not just a man thing. It's not just all about the guy enjoying himself. It's actually created by God to be enjoyed by both husband and wife. You know, I come from a generation where people will say, well, you know, it's just the man, just the men. They're always after just one thing and this and that. In this generation, as I've seen this generation growing up, uh, the younger, younger women are beginning to think like men and acting like men and, and thinking that that's a good thing, it's not a good thing. But it's never been just about men. In the Bible, the Bible teaches that, that sexual intimacy is really about the couple. It's something that both enjoy, both male and female. It's not just men who enjoy it, it's men and women. It was created by God for both's enjoyment. And Paul had to write about that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 4 and 5, he said, The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. He went on to say, Do not deprive one another, except with consent, for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. He's saying that, that a, a married man and a married woman cease having just their own life. They now have one that is together. If the wife doesn't feel like being intimate or the husband doesn't feel like being intimate, and yet one of the partners desires intimacy, then you satisfy their desire because that's the right thing to do, even if you don't feel like doing that. There are a lot of things that you do that you may not feel like doing, but it's the right thing to do at that moment. And so what happens is there is a time to deprive one another, and that's a time when you're giving yourselves over to prayer, and that's with consent. That's an agreement. But the fact is, sometimes intimacy is experienced simply out of love for that person and not because of personal desire. Paul was saying, put the other person's needs before your own. And in this particular case, he's speaking concerning that. Now, I want you to notice something in verse 6 where it says, "...until the day breaks and the shadows flee away." I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense until the day breaks and the shadows flee away. This isn't a one-night stand. I'm going to stay with you, not only through this time of intimacy, but when you wake up in the morning, I'll be with you then too. See, sometimes people get involved and it's kind of like this. Come to my apartment and then I'll drive you home and then I got other things to do. What Solomon is saying is simply this. This is something that's going to last this is something that you'll wake up with and, and I'll be with you today and I'll be with you forever, basically. We're going to have one another. It's, I'm here forever with you, not just for a few minutes. And I love you and I want to be with you. And so when he's speaking in that way, until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go to my, to, uh, my way to the mountain of Myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. He's simply saying, this is something that's going to last. I'm not going to leave you once we have had intimacy. I will remain with you. And in verse 7, you are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. She has disrobed, and he's telling her, you are beautiful in every way. He's not criticizing her. He's not saying things about her body. He's simply saying, there's nothing wrong with you at all. There's no negative comments about that. She's saying, you're perfect for me, and I want you to know that. Intimacy begins with words. It begins with sincerity, with no pressure. It, 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 it continues on with, 
with an awareness of the other person's needs and the willingness and desire to meet those needs on both parts. And it continues on past that initial intimacy into a lifetime of relationship. Why wait? Because it's worth it. Why wait? Because you're building on the right foundation. Now, in verse 8, the response, come with me from Lebanon, my, my spouse, with me from Lebanon, look from the top of Amana, from the top of Sinir and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, with one link of your necklace. How fair is your love, my sister, my spouse? How much better than wine is your love and the scent of your perfumes and all spices? Your lips, oh, my spouse, drip as a honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. He's saying, I want to take you from the low all the way to the high, and I want you to be with me. I want you to go to the mountaintop with me and to share my passion that I have. When, when it says in verse 9, you have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse, my spouse, there's a passion involved here. He's passionately kissing her, and her kisses intoxicate him, and her perfumes are making his head spin. But I want to develop something with you. It's going to take a moment to do that. I want you to see how he calls her my sister, my spouse. That's an important thing that I don't want to pass up. My sister, my spouse. I got saved at the age of 20. About a month after getting saved, I went to San Luis Obispo with a friend of mine named Jim, and Jim and I were there at a, uh, at a pier that's right outside of the city limits. And we were walking on the pier together, just kind of just talking and all. And there was one person on that pier that day. They were all way at the end of the pier, and they were dropping some, some uh, traps because that person was, was trapping uh, some of the crab that was down there, and he was going to take them and use them. Uh, for food later on, they were going to eat the, the crab that he was catching. And so we walked up, Jim and, Jim and I walked up, and the guy looks up at us and he says, hey guys, how you doing? And I looked back at this guy and he was around my age and I said, uh, oh, we're doing good. He's, I said, we're just here looking at the beauty of creation. See, but what a wonderful creation God has, has, has uh, produced for us. So he looks at me and he goes, you're a Christian. And I said, yes, I just got saved. And he goes, I'm a Christian too. I said, really? And we began to visit. And he says, um, when did you get saved? And I said, in December, on the 27th. I said, I was at the Hollywood Palladium. And uh, an invitation was given. I gave my heart to Christ. He goes, the Hollywood Palladium on the 27th of December? I said, yes. He says, I was there. He goes, I actually am a musician. And I was playing at that concert. So the concert I was playing at, you got saved at. I said, oh, how cool is that? And so we were visiting, and, and now we're starting to get along real well. And he says, look it, I'm going to be doing some music tonight at one of the churches here in the town. He says, why don't you come to my place, and, and uh, you know, we'll fix you a meal, and come with us tonight to the uh, Bible study worship. And I said, that'd be great. So we went with him. And while we were there, he's doing his music, and it's a small church, a small church group. And as he's sharing his music, I turned to his wife. His wife um, was sitting right next to me. I turned to her. And I said, you know, I go, I'm, I'm really grown to, uh, to love your, your brother. Then I said, oh, I'm sorry, I, I mean your husband. And she said something to me that I have never forgotten. 41 years, I've never forgotten what she said. She said this. She said, no, you were right the first time. He's my brother and he's my husband. He was my brother before we got married. And he's been my brother since we got married. She says... The Lord has made us brother and sister as well as husband and wife. That spiritual aspect of relationship. My wife, Marie, was my sister before she became my wife. And I will treat a sister in the Lord differently than I might treat a woman whom I think I own because after all, she's my wife. There's that attitude that you can have. I need you to do this. Would you do that without showing courtesy? You know, I, I can be one who just I need you to. And I can speak that. I, I, I remember when we were uh, fairly newly married. Uh, Marie said or did something that I didn't like and it bothered me. And I spoke sharply to her. And, and when I spoke sharply to her, 
the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart in a way that I've never forgotten and said, you be careful how you speak to her. That's my little girl. I've never forgotten that. That's my little girl. And the Lord reminded me that Marie belonged to him long before she became my wife. She belongs to him. In your marriage, this is so practical that many people ignore what I'm saying. In your marriage, if your wife or husband is a believer, they are your sister or your brother in Jesus, and you treat them differently than you would treat a husband, just a husband or a wife. I guarantee you. I guarantee you. You show them courtesies. You speak to them differently. You act differently towards them in, in some of the practical social ways. You just treat them in a different fashion. I've brought that into my marriage. Marie is my sister as well as my wife. And so I want to treat her as a sister in the Lord. And so when you see this and, and he's calling her my sister, my spouse, that gives me some insight into a relationship. You treat them with respect and love. That spouse is more than just a husband, just a wife. They're my family in Christ. And when you treat them like that, it deepens the relationship in ways that you can't imagine. Marie and I had been going for a few months, going around, and um, she had Bible questions, and she would ask me, she still to this day will ask me Bible questions, and she asked me, in heaven, are we going to be married? Because she'd already asked me to marry her, and I had said yes. <laughs> she said, in heaven, are we going to be married? And I laughed. I started laughing. I said, no. Why? Why would we be married in heaven? And I said, in heaven, we're like the angels. There's no reproduction in heaven. There's a set amount. So we get into heaven, and that's it. And, 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 and as I'm looking at her, I'm, I'm kind of, why would you ask something like that? She starts to cry. And I look at her, and I go, why are you crying? I wanted to be married with you in heaven. What? <laughs> I, said, the thought of, I said, the thought of that just blows my mind. I said, most people can't handle me for 45 minutes. That's the length of a church service. <laughs> I said, well, you want to, you want me to be with you forever? Are you kidding me? And she wasn't. I had never experienced a love that would tolerate me more than a date, let alone, let alone having a desire for a lifetime into an eternity. When you grab hold of that, it changes you. It changes the way you think. It changes the way that you address one another. It changes the way you, you treat one another it's a higher relationship than just looking at a person saying, this is my wife, this is my sister, this is my spouse. This is a relationship that God brought together. We will be together for eternity, forever and ever. Married to no, no, we won't be married in heaven, no. We'll have a deep relationship, though. We'll hang around. Marie and Al, you'll see us, you know, hanging around. I'm not going to let... Very many people hang around her more than I do. I'll be with her. And I look forward to that. But Solomon is giving us some insight. Husbands and wives, you're deeper than simply saying, this is mine. It's deeper than that. This is my family. This is everything. We're together united in Christ. Now as he's sharing... We see in verse 12, a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, fragrant henna with spikenard, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. And then the Shulamite says, Awake, O north wind, and come, O south. Blow upon my garden, that its spices may flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. When he says in verse 12, A garden encloses my sister, my spouse, and it speaks of her about being a garden enclosed or a spring that is shut up or a fountain sealed, he's speaking of her purity. 
Because you see, the garden was enclosed, the spring was shut up, and the fountain was sealed. He's speaking of her purity. Her purity had been safeguarded, and her virtue captivated him. We have young virgins today who think, oh, I'm not sophisticated. Your purity is captivating to people. They see it as a, as a, as a, a beautiful thing. Solomon saw it that way. But her purity had been safeguarded, so it was her virtue that captivated him. In verses 13 through 15, when it speaks of the plants being an orchard, that refers to the completion of lovemaking with Solomon. The time together has been enjoyable and fulfilling to both of them. Before marriage, she was close to sexual intimacy, but now she is appropriately open to it. And that's why in verse 16, we read the words, Awake, O north wind, and come, O south. She wants to be awakened completely to the joy of physical love with Solomon, and she wants her husband to experience her fully. She's not holding her love back from him. It was appropriate in the past to do so, but now it's appropriate to satisfy him completely. And that's why she says, let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. She's saying, I'm holding nothing back from you. And he is completely satisfied in her. And how did this begin? It began with words of love. You are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. It began with love, with words of love. He didn't pressure her. He didn't force her. He didn't get her to do things that he wanted to do that she might not want to. He treated her with respect. He treated her as the precious, precious gift that she is. And she responded to that by saying, she's here. She says, I'm here for you in every way that you want me. Because when you love somebody like that, they're totally open to you like she is. Father, we ask that we would learn what lovemaking really is. It really begins with words and sincerity. It begins with love that's pure. It doesn't begin with pressure. It doesn't precede a marriage covenant. Intimacy is the reward of waiting. And so I ask, Lord, that you would work within us and those who are single within this fellowship, awaken a sense of the need for purity and a need for intimacy and a need to be a brother and a sister in the Lord before they're anything else, treating each other with respect. Because even as Paul reminded us, we treat the younger women as sisters with all purity we don't take advantage of our own sisters. We treat them with purity because they are our sisters. And so I'm asking, Lord, that we might get that message and live it. And may our marriages, those of us who are married, may they be a constant honeymoon, one of love and enjoying of one another in every aspect that you've created us to enjoy. We lift this to you now, Lord, and pray that you'd continue to move amongst us. Even as our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, there may be some who right now need some prayer. You need to get right with the Lord. There are issues perhaps you're dealing with. Whatever the case, you need some prayer. And if you want prayer, would you raise your hand and let me pray for you right now, right where you're at. Just raise your hand so that I might see you. Lord, you see these hands, and you know the reason they're being raised to you. And I'm asking that as you reach down, that you would meet these, these hands as they're being held up, meet these needs that are being represented by these hands. Lord, and you know the heart of these individuals and the greatest desires and their longings. You know the regrets and pains that they carry. And you know the wounds that only you can heal. So I'm asking that you would reach down right now and you would touch these lives. And Father, if there have been errors and sin, if there have been mistakes made, poor judgments, I'm praying that right now you would establish them once again on the rock of Jesus Christ. And may they just come back to you, Lord, right now and be washed and be clean. And from this day on, may their lives be clean in you. So may your spirit work, and may you do your work, and we receive from you and thank you. Bless you, Lord. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, would you keep moving in all of us now and work with us, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. I pray the study was encouraging, and I want to thank you for your continued support and prayers and invite you to join us next Sunday night as we move into the next part of our study. As I mentioned earlier, if you would like to give your offering, you can do so online. If you're using a computer, click on the Give button in the upper right corner of your screen. If you're watching on your mobile device or iPad, click Give under the Menu button. 
If this is your first time giving digitally, follow the instruction under four ways to give to process your gift. And finally, you can either mail your checks to 12205 North Pipeline Avenue, Chino, California, 91710. Or if you're able, you can come to the sanctuary and use the kiosk we have in the foyer that are set up to process gifts. You can also place your gift in an envelope handed to one of the receptionists in the foyer. So thank you. God be with you. And we look forward to having you with us once again.